good afternoon everyone uh, um, thanks for joining us on this auspicious day uh, and one of the most important days in the history of indian science uh, if the uh, the events of this morning which was discussion of science over poster session with, uh, with young students and researchers was exciting it only gets better because we have our national science day talk this year by none other than professor p balram uh, when we were uh, 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 informally inquiring people whom should be invited. I mean, there one voice, one name which everyone suggested was Professor Balram, and the reason is obvious because Professor Balram has a good connect with students, young or old, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and of course, Kopal is going to formally introduce him, but I would like to express my gratitude to him for on a short notice, he agreed for the invitation and say, okay, Pushkar, I will do it. You decide the time, whatever time, uh, I will really do it. Thanks very much, sir. For, for accepting the invitation, and, and we look forward to your talk. And before we do that, Gopal, I know you don't like long introductions. Gopalan will be at least introducing you to the audience. And of course, you don't need introduction to most of us, despite that. It will be nice for young people to know more about you. Gopalan, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pushkar. And uh, it's a pleasure. And I promise I, would, I won't take more than two minutes. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Balaram, especially for the students in the audience and uh, everyone else. Uh, needless to say, he is a well-known figure. And if I start describing his achievements, then there will be no time for the lecture. Uh, just briefly, uh, he studied in Ferguson College, Pune, and graduated from IIT Kanpur, then PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, and postdoc with Professor Woodward. And one of the things that he said in one of his lectures is that uh, the days when 70s, when I was growing up, Telegram was the Twitter where you had to pay for every letter. And Professor Woodward, such a flamboyant person, he sent a one page telegram to Professor G. N. Ramachandran as a recommendation letter. And then on uh, 1973, he started his independent career. And it's astounding to think of it. By next year, he will be completing 50 years of independent academic research. And he has been a, a, a director of IASC and he has varied and very different areas of topics and also gives very candid opinions on the issues. And I was very relieved when I got the title uh, chemistry and biology in the age of coronavirus with no punctuations so that I don't have to worry about eats, shoots and leaves. And my interactions I remember very well attending his course in 1991 and also towards the end of my PhD, approaching him for a solution cell for infrared kinetic studies as a fidgety student. And since then, I've been following his work very closely and he's one of the governing and inspiring figure. And we are all very fortunate to hear him today. And with this, I request all of you to mute yourself. And, and at the end, we will have question sessions. Please raise your hand or type in your questions and we will make sure uh, all the queries are addressed. Thank you very much. With that, Professor Balaram, uh, we yield the online stage to you. Thank you very much, Pushkar. Thank you very much, Gopalan, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be able to join you on Science Day. And the topic that I have picked is to talk generally about chemistry and biology in the age of the coronavirus. I'm going to start with our chemicals in nature and a story. I'll give you an abridged history of the coronavirus. I'll discuss a little biology and a little chemistry, very little. And then at the end, maybe conclude with some reflections on the evolutionary history of the coronavirus spike protein during the pandemic. What I have on this slide are pictured the foundational pillars of chemistry and biology. Mendeleev on the left with his periodic table and Darwin on the right with uh, his ideas of natural selection. Slide doesn't move now. I share and unshare again. You may please, yeah, there is some buffering going on here. I'll stop sharing. Start once.
HCV. Um, and it doesn't move. Let me see if it moves in this without having the full screen uh, moving this either. Yes, please. Okay, I can move it here. Okay, now, so I yeah, with a little it. delay, we are able to see that too. Yes. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll move to my next slide, really. We really, on science day, we have to really ask ourselves, what is uh, science? And science is, of course, the study of nature. So I looked for a definition of what nature might be and found it really in the very first issue of the journal Nature. Most of you will, of course, realize that the most widely read journals in science are called Nature and Science. And the very first editorial in the 1869 issue of Nature was written by Thomas Huxley. Huxley did not write the editorial. Instead, what he did was he translated an essay by the German poet von Goethe, in which Goethe defined nature. He said, nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. I'm really going to begin by asking you what does chemistry and biology see in nature? If you're a biologist, for example, the first thing that you might see are plants, animals, which are visible to your eyes. And when you look at plants and animals, what you're struck with is the enormous diversity of biological species. Chemists, on the other hand, extract molecules from nature, from plants, from animals, uh, from bacteria, from anything that lives. And molecules are extraordinarily diverse. I show you here just caffeine and morphine, which come from the coffee plant and the opium poppy. So one question does arise. Why do plants make these complex molecules? Now, one of the best definitions I found of secondary metabolism, which leads to these molecules, is that secondary metabolism represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. So chemistry is really at the heart of biology. If a biological organism needs to solve a problem in its environment, it has to turn to chemistry. And this is why you have this remarkable diversity in the chemistry of natural products. But as biologists, we study microorganisms, we study plants, we study animals. In bi conventional biochemistry, you classify them as primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. The students are very comfortable with this. What this definition of secondary metabolism tells you is, there is nothing secondary about secondary metabolites. They are, in fact, very important for the organs. So there are some general questions that one might ask. And this is the kind of question which you might ask on Science Day. If you're a chemist or a biologist. How many chemicals are produced in nature? This would be chemical space. How many living organisms are there in nature? This would be biological space. And we look at the interplay between chemistry and biology, they're really looking at chemical space along one axis, biological space along the other axis, defining really an infinite. We can ask how are these chemicals synthesized? That is the biosynthesis, which we know requires genes and enzymes. We might ask a more fundamental question. Why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? What is the biological imperative? And lastly, organisms, 
every organism other than human beings really communicates with one another largely by means of chemicals. Certainly microbes, plants, insects communicate almost exclusively by means of chemicals. The larger animals sometimes a little bit by sound. Human beings are the only ones to communicate with a complex language. So we can ask the question, how are the chemicals of one organism recognized by the target organism? And this takes us to the subject of receptor proteins. On this slide, I show you a chemical. Many of you may not like chemical structures, but I show one on the right hand side of the slide. That is the structure of capsaicin, the molecule which provides the red pepper with its pungency. Looks like a simple molecule, but its biosynthesis is extraordinarily complex. That's what you see on the left hand side of the slide. You can see that there are two simple starting materials, phenylalanine on the left, and in the middle you have the amino acid valine. But then by a series of chemical transformations, these are transformed into other intermediates which are put together to make capsaicin. But each chemical transformation, the process by which one chemical structure goes to another, is mediated by an enzyme. It's only then that these reactions can happen in the organism. So you can immediately see there are many, many arrows, and therefore there must be many enzymes which are involved in the biosynthesis. But if there are many enzymes, there must be many genes, and therefore we have an enormous complexity of the biosynthetic pathway. On this slide, I simplify this. So if you have a substrate and we go to a product, we need an enzyme. And if you need an enzyme, we need a gene. But if you have a multi-step biosynthetic pathway, you must have unique enzymes encoded by separate genes. This, of course, means that the genes must be arranged near one another, and they must now all be turned on or off by mechanisms which we now know are the mechanisms by which operons actually operate. I don't want to stress the importance of enzymes because I have to tell you my story. And this is only a preliminary to telling you a story. Francis Crick, as early as 1958, and if any of you have not seen this article in the Symposia of the Society for Experimental Biology, should go and look at it. It's 1958, and it's a remarkable article because this is before the genetic code was actually unraveled. And much of what we call molecular biology, the central dogma of molecular biology and so on, is actually in these pages. Crick says the main function of proteins is to act as enzymes. And then he adds, it is at first sight paradoxical that it is probably easier for an organism to produce a new protein than to produce a new small molecule. And this is true because I've illustrated the capsaicin synthesis. And then, of course, he concludes by saying, there seems little point in genes doing anything else but protein synthesis. This is still true. You know, for the last two years or more, we've been affected by the coronavirus. And because we've been affected by the coronavirus, when we went into lockdown, it was an unfamiliar situation for most of us. And what could we do when we were locked down? We could read. And this is an article that I read in the New Yorker magazine. The article had an interesting title, Does Hurting Make Us Human? And what this article described was a lady on the left, the bottom left, a British lady, who because of a combination of genetic abnormalities, she had a very limited negative emotional range which meant that she would never feel unhappy. She had an expansive capacity for positive emotion. And when we read this, we would say how wonderful, you're always happy, irrespective of what happens to you. But then it turned out that there was another problem with her. She was entirely insensitive to physical pain. And this is where the problem really starts. Why was she insensitive to physical pain? 
you could have the most painful orthopedic surgery, come out of anesthesia and require no painkillers whatsoever. And that's where this molecule enters. And this is the story. The molecule that you see, the structure on the left, and I am going to say a few general words about chemistry as I go along. Many of you may not like chemical structure, but look at that structure in the middle of the stride. Look at its name. It's called anandamide. And you can immediately see that there is an Indian connection to this the word ananda in its name. Anandamide is a molecule which is broken down by an enzyme, fatty acid amide hydrolase, into arachidonic acid and ethanolamine. Arachidonic acid is a common constituent of membranes. It's a product of lipid metabolism. Ethanolamine is also a constituent of membranes also a constituent of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. But what we have is an ability to take these two molecules, arachidonic acid and ethanolamine, and convert it into anandamide. So we need a balance of anandamide in the brain. And what these scientists did, a paper appeared in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2019, they identified a defect in this lady. We had a defect in the enzyme which hydrolyzed anandamide. Of course, you might ask me at this point, what is anandamide? i show you what it is. On the top of this slide is the molecule tetrahydrocannabinol, an impressive name, but it is the active constituent of marijuana or hashish. We've had a lot of discussion in recent times in India about marijuana. If you're a film star and you have a few grams of uh, marijuana with you, you could be arrested by the Narcotics Bureau. Now, hashish has been used in India for millennia. And it turns out that the active constituent of hashish is tetrahydrocannabinol. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about tetrahydrocannabinol, except to say at this point, that the structure was determined in a famous paper in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1964. It was determined by an Israeli scientist called Raphael Mishulam. And what Mishulam wondered was, why does the substance act on the brain? After all, the brain should not have receptors to recognize the active constituent of marijuana. He then therefore started another problem. That is to find out what was the endogenous ligand for what is today called a cannabinoid receptor. And so he turned to pig brain and tried to isolate from pig brain a molecule which would act like tetrahydrocannabinol. And on the next slide, I show you the result. This was another famous paper which appeared in Nature in 1992. So you can see there's been a long interregnum. Between 1964, when the structure of cannabinol was determined, and 1992, when the structure of the brain constituent that binds to the cannabinoid receptor was determined. 20 year, 28 years of painstaking work. This is how sometimes the best science is done. And I think we should think about this on science day. What he got from four and a half kilograms of pig brain was about half a milligram of pure substance. And this was in the early 1990s. And he used the techniques which were available then. The classical radio ligand binding assay, displacement of tetrahydro, radio labeled tetrahydrocannabinol by the molecule that he'd isolated, which he called anandamide. And then of course, on the right, the electron impact mass spectrum from which he deduced the structure. It would have been very difficult to deduce these structures in those days. He was asked after when he talked about this work, why did you not look for a Hebrew name? Why did you take a word from Sanskrit, which meant bliss? Meshulam joked, we looked for a Hebrew name, but as you may well be aware, Jews are not very happy. We have a lot of words for being down and so on, but not so many words for extreme joy. You might think about this today in the context of Ukraine and Eastern Europe, which had a very large number of Jews who lived there. 
many of whom were killed and displaced during the Second World War. And today you will see that if you know a little bit of history, when you hear President Putin say that he would like to denazify Ukraine, you can see that it is an irony because the president of Ukraine is a Jew. The Jews definitely have not been very happy people. I've shown you now that there is a strong connection between chemistry and biology, between the molecules of nature and our responses to those molecules. We might now turn as a digression to the age in which we are, which is I call the age of the coronavirus. When the coronavirus struck in early 2020, very soon there were all these images. And look at these images in Secunderabad, in Chennai, in Italy, in France. They have excited the imagination of everyone. It is that spherical particle with the spiky projections. We're all familiar with it now. Cakes have been made, helmets have been made, and even an auto rickshaw decorated with this. The coronavirus has taken a tremendous toll. And this is a July 2021 slide. And you can see that the number of people who have died is enormous. The number of people who have been infected is also enormous. But I won't spend any time on that. What is a virus? The best definition I've found is in Peter Medawar's Dictionary of Biology, a philosophical dictionary of biology, entitled Aristotle to Jews. Here he defines a virus as a piece of bad news wrapped up in. Bad news is, of course, the nucleic acid, which provides the instructions for replication. And there's the protein on the surface, which we all now know as the coronavirus spike protein. This is, of course, a phospholipid bilayer, too. And on the next slide, I'll show you a picture. A picture which emerged after the SARS-CoV-1 episode of 2002-2003. Most of the techniques of modern science were used to study SARS-CoV-1, but everybody forgot about it until SARS-CoV-2 appeared again a few years later. The phospholipid bilayer holds the membrane together. And therefore, the constant injunction to wash your hands with soap and water is very good or to use an alcohol-based sanitizer. But this is not new. Remember that William Osler, one of the founding fathers of modern medicine, many years ago said that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectant. Sometimes it turns out that soap and water are available in plenty, but common sense, of course, is in short supply. So when the coronavirus epidemic began, I wondered what was the coronavirus and what did it look like? And we must study the coronavirus. And therefore, I followed the advice of Al Pacino acting as Michael Corleone in The Godfather in the second part of the movie, where he says, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So if the coronavirus is an enemy, we must now know everything there is to be known about it. So I asked myself a question at that time. When was the coronavirus discovered and who discovered it? And then it turned out that I spent time in the total lockdown of March to May 2020, shortly before I was infected myself. And I wrote an article in the popular magazines, which I will show you. And then this was picked up. And I came to feature in a newsletter in the small town of Ure in Colorado in the United States. It has a population of 1,000. And I was interviewed by an archivist in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I told her at that time that it is a tribute to the power of the internet that the road from Ure to Flagstaff passes through Bangalore. It also seems to be that in some strange way, the led us to its discoverer by turning the world upside down. It turned out that I had found the first author of the paper in which the first coronavirus was reported, and that she eventually died in the little town of Ure in Colorado, where she had retired. But I could not find a picture of her, and I found the picture in an archive in Flagstaff, Arizona. And the story that I put together is actually presented in this article couple of articles in Frontline magazine at that time. I'll tell you what I did. 
I went back to the literature. I went back to the literature and I found this paper of 1967. I found this not by searching the literature, but what happened was that popular press, uh, the National Geographic and others, had a picture of the lady who you see on the slide, Joan Almeida. She took the first electron micrograph of the coronavirus. Therefore, they labeled her as the discoverer of the coronavirus. On the left, you see the picture of David Terrell. He was a prominent virologist working on the common cold virus. And together they wrote this paper in 1967. It was called the morphology of three previously uncharacterized human viruses that grow in organ culture. In red, I have highlighted what Terrell felt was the most important finding. He said that two human respiratory viruses, 229E, and B814 are morphologically identical. The electron micrograph that you see in the middle is the first picture of the coronavirus from which we derive the image that we use today. But when you read a paper, it's important to read every part of it. It's important to read the experimental, the legends, and so on. And sometimes even the acknowledged ones. I found that figure 1AB which showed the picture of the coronavirus, said this type of particle was seen when an organ culture was infected with strain 229E. That was interesting. And then when I read the acknowledgement, I found that they thanked Dr. B. Hambre for the 229E virus. So at this point, I wondered who was Dr. B. Hambre and uh, do I find a picture? So I went back again to the literature and found that the paper that they referred to was a paper in the Proceedings of the Society for Experimental Biology and Medicine in 1966, one year earlier. And here you see it, a new virus isolated from the human respiratory tract and the name Dorothy Hamre. And once I got the name Dorothy, I knew it was a lady. And so I began to search for the picture of a lady. This picture is remarkable. She discovered that it's a human pathogen. She measured the size of the virus, 89 millimicrons. In today's units, 89 nanometers. And it turned out that these were isolated from the nasal secretions of medical students at the University of Chicago. He also discovered that the nucleic acid in these viruses was RNA by showing that they were not inhibited with the fluorodeoxyuridine or iodeoxyuridine. Many years later, there was a paper in 2018 where there is severe acute respiratory distress in adults infected with 299E. So now, if you go back to the Tyrell paper of 1967, you can see they also measured the dimensions now from electron microscopy, and they got the dimensions between 80 and 100 nanometers. So Dorothy Hamre's measurement was remarkable. The term coronaviruses entered the literature in 1968 when a little news item appeared in Nature. The collection of authors had written a letter to Nature. Instead of publishing the letter, the editor of Nature now summarized their conclusions. And there again I found the name of D. E. Hambre. Much later in 1975, they acquired, the coronavirus acquired its formal name in a journal Intervirology, but by this time, D. Hamre's name was no longer there. So I wondered who she was, and I searched PubMed, Google, etc., and found she had 40 publications in PubMed between 1943 and 1972. I found that she was a productive scientist beginning in bacteriology in 1941 and transitioning to virology with a publishing career which spanned this period. This interested me. There were very few women in science in the United States in the early 1940s. It was the time of the war. So she must have got her PhD before the Second World War in the years of the Great Depression. And no photograph was found. I found many photographs, but they were all of younger people. They were not of virologists. They were sometimes pictures of other authors. Eventually, I found a reference to her 
in an Arizona archives. This is the archives of the Northern Arizona University, where there was a collection called the Alexander Brownlee Collection. I wrote to them saying that I'm interested in finding a photograph of Dorothy Brownlee, because by now my detective work showed me that she married a gentleman called Alexander Brownlee. On the 29th of April, 2020, which is well into the pandemic, about a few weeks into the lockdowns, that I actually wrote this email. And shortly thereafter, I got into an extraordinary correspondence with the archivists in Arizona, who never opened the photographs and checked what they were. They eagerly went back and found the discoverer of the coronavirus, whom I now picture on this slide. So if you now ask the question, who discovered the coronavirus? It is this slide which should now be used. These are the discoverers of the coronavirus. Dorothy Hamley, David Terrell, and Juno Minor. But much later in 1996, David Terrell, who was a prominent scientist, came to the conclusion about the coronaviruses in chapter 60 of medical microbiology. He said coronaviruses cause acute mild upper respiratory infection, common for cold. And remember what I say on this slide, it is of relevance later on. They fall into two serotypes, OC43 and 229E. Once it was a cold virus, people lost interest in the coronavirus. But somewhat later in 2002-2003, there was a new infection which was identified in the Vietnam French Hospital of Hanoi. This was in February of 2003 that they requested help from the WHO. In March of 2003, extraordinary quarantine symptom, uh, was imposed in Vietnam. And this was largely due to the efforts of the Italian physician who I show you here, Carlo Urbani, who went there. And it turned out that Urbani is the man who realized that it was a new infectious disease, very virulent very severe in its infection and therefore it needed to be isolated. It was isolated at that time, but Armani contracted the disease. He was hospitalized and quarantined and died on the 29th of March 2003. This outbreak of SARS, SARS-CoV-1, was controlled after 8,000 infections and 800 deaths. But at this point, we did not really pay much attention to them. But since I promised in my title that I would talk about a little chemistry, I'm going to digress into chemistry. Why do I talk about chemistry when we are in the age of biology? This is largely because you can't do better in defining chemistry and use the words of Arthur Convert, the man who discovered DNA polymerase and sparked off the biotechnology revolution. Honberg, in the latter part of his career, called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. One of the sad facts of biology in India that enough attention is not paid to chemistry. And it is sometimes an even sadder fact that chemists do not pay enough attention to the chemistry of biology. Is chemistry important? It is. And I will take you back to physics. The Feynman Lectures, Volume 1, the first chapter, matter is made up of atoms. And Feynman says something very interesting here. He says, if in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information and the fewest words? He then adds, he answers his question. I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact of what you wish to call it. Then he talks about atoms and how they come together to make molecules. Today, when we are on the verge of a cataclysm, like for example, if you see last night, when Mr. Putin put nuclear deterrence on alert, it turns out that is the kind of cataclysm that Feynman always anticipated because he had worked on the Manhattan Project to produce the first atom bomb. The physicists of the 1960s 
were acutely aware of the ability of technology to destroy everybody. How do length and how are chemistry and biology linked? They are linked only by length and time scales. Length scales because molecules are small, biological aggregates of molecules are very large. You can see the virus there right in between the ribosome and the mitochondria. Therefore, these are large structures, much larger than the simple molecules of chemistry. And what are the time scales? In chemistry, sometimes things happen very quickly. Sometimes in biology, the time scales are very much longer. Is chemistry important? Here, of course, is a cartoon which summarizes it. The gentleman's working on a crossword puzzle and he asks the lady sitting next to him, what's a nine letter word for biotechnology? He's of course very clever. She immediately answers chemistry. And this is true. Today, you must also ask what is a nine letter word for material science? That will also be chemistry. So when you think of nanotechnology and biotechnology coming together to give you nanoparticle formulated drugs which will cure every disease. Remember that you must try and understand the detailed chemistry. Chemical structures are the alphabets of chemistry and one reason why many people are turned off chemistry is that they are very diverse. It's like learning a new language. So you must learn the language of structures if one goes to learn the language of just as symbols in the alphabet of mathematics, without understanding them, one cannot really do mathematics. This is the problem with chemistry and mathematics as opposed to physics and biology. Physics and biology allow you to relate to everything that is around you. Chemistry and mathematics sometimes do not have the same effect. But of course, today we must have a good endorsement of chemistry on National Science Day. And you can see that the Prime Minister declared in 2019, after victory in the polls, that chemistry defeated arithmetic in the 2019 poll. I will leave it to your imagination to understand in what context to use the term chemistry and arithmetic. The foundational pillars of chemistry are illustrated on this slide. There's diversity, Mendeleev, unity, Wohler. When he took ammonium cyanate, which was an inorganic substance, and converted it into urea, which is produced by the kidney. And those of you who have not read this should read this. His excitement is reflected in a letter that he wrote to Bazelius, where he said, I can make urea now without the use of kidney, man or dog. Holtzman, a physicist who gave us the ideas of dynamic, also gave us the first ideas of atoms, their movement, a relationship, the movement of relationship to heat and give us the ideas of entropy. Pasteur, of course, famous for his work in microbiology, but his most fundamental contributions have been in chemistry when he could well be viewed as the founding father of organic stereochemistry when he resolved tartaric acid and showed the importance of molecular structure to its physical properties. Where does all this chemistry come from? You must have matter, you must have elements, you must have Mendeleev's periodic table. I show you a book here, Jacob Bronowski's Ascent of Man. And Bronowski here traces the ascent of man from long, long ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, from the earliest of human beings, all the way to the current age. He says in all the stars there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structure. Here I have the most important sentence in red. He says, matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin and biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. Remember the word evolution is hugely important. He then in very picturesque language describes the formation of carbon. He says it's formed in a star and three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. Remember, life is improbable. We rely on all the elements that have 
here on earth and life evolved on earth. It is rather easy to destroy life, rather hard to create it. Let's return to the violence. Now that we have appreciated a little bit of chemistry, we can go back and look at the detailed structure of the violence. As early as 2006, by electron cryo microscopy, we had a detailed picture of what the spike looked like and how the other constituents were arranged. Look at the mean particle diameter here, 82 to 94 nanometers. Dorothy Hambray's 1966 measurement was 89 nanometers. Wonderfully accurate. And this is why we must pay a tribute on Science Day to those scientists who have worked over the decades to bring modern science to the state at which it is today. Once the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 infected all of us, it turned out that scientists could very quickly now, because of available techniques, prior knowledge, quickly put together the structure of the spike protein. Today, when students are enamored by the flood of papers which appear in the journal Science and Nature, remember the words of Newton. You're doing all of this because you stood on the shoulders of others who have done a great deal more under far more difficult circumstances. Today we have the structures of the coronavirus spike protein, complex to its receptor, and one can study many things about infection, neutralization, etc. in great detail. But that's not what I want to talk to you about. I might ask, do viruses belong to chemistry or to biology? Are viruses living? If you take a biology textbook, you will find that viruses are excluded from the tree of life. The three branches that every student is familiar with is bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The literature is controversial. You will find reasons to exclude viruses from the tree of life. Then you will find articles which ask the question, do viruses exchange genes across the super kingdoms of life? So we must now have a digression into biology. Now, if you digress into biology, you cannot escape Darwin and natural selection. That one of the tragedies of modern molecular biology is its sort of distancing from natural selection, adaptation, evolution. An understanding of evolutionary concepts is most important for beginning students in biology. Darwin said, and I quote here, because this is important on Science Day, there is grandeur in this view of life. It is several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. He invokes the creator because he was a religious man. And then he says, while this planet has gone cycling on, according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, Endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Is this beauty of biology, is this beauty of the integration of chemistry and biology that really comes from Darwin's words? The three pillars of modern biology are shown on the slide. What are they? There's genetics on the left, Gregor Mendel again in the middle of the 19th century. Charles Darwin on the right, evolution by variation and selection. How is Mendelian genetics related to Darwinian evolution? It is related, of course, by the chemistry of heredity, the chemistry of DNA. And the chemistry of DNA has its origins in Oswald Avery's famous work, establishing DNA as a genetic material. Sadly, the 1953 paper of Watson and Pick, which I picture here, the Pick does not have Avery as a reference. But it is this detailed chemistry of DNA, the AT, GC, base pairs, etc. All of this and mutations which allow variation and phenotypic selection. Biology now, of course, is continual variation in response to environmental stresses and strains. Organisms and their behavior are modulated by their environment. Today, of course, in the years that have followed in the 21st century, after the announcement of the genome project just at the beginning of the century, so many genomes are known. What have they taught us? I would say they, have, they should have taught us many, many things, but we don't seem to have learned from. 
if you look at the connection between the genomes in this tree, humans, chimpanzees, rats, mice, pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs are very close to one another. They are related. It is this unity in biology that we must understand on Science Day. We fight a lot about pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, dogs all the time. But I don't think we should if we understand biology. But variation and selection are important. I thought I would spend the last part of my presentation talking to you about how variation, random mutation, and natural selection can be illustrated by the case of the spike protein of the coronavirus COVID-2. Here it is. The crystal structure of the coronavirus spike protein there, the trio em structure there, and let's move on. Here's an old paper in 1970 by the famous evolutionist John Maynard Smith. Look at the title, Natural Selection and the Concept of Protein Space. This entire paper can be put on two slides. I deleted the second slide to reduce the number of slides. But what Maynard Smith said, illustrated was how changes or mutational changes can change meaning. And he used the four letter word, word. And he said by making single letter mutations, war, door, gone, gene, you can now completely change the meaning. Single letter mutations at every stage, leading now to a word which still has a meaning. And this is exactly what happens with proteins. Small changes, which are still biologically functional, eventually changing completely the function of a protein. Today, we use the 20 letter alphabet for amino acids to understand proteins. I provide a reference for you, for those of you who want to read. This is by Francis Arnold, paper entitled The Library of Maynard Smith, who I showed on the previous slide, as my search for meaning in the protein universe. She wrote this article 11 years ago. A few years ago, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for her work on uh, evolution of bacteria in the test tube and uh, trying to use this for useful biotechnological purposes. And she, her abstract says, draws attention to what is called the Library of Bebel. And she says, this is by an Argentinian author, Georges Louis Borges. It's a very small essay. I've shown it here on the slide. It's available on the internet. You can see what this library would look like. This is an infinite and unsearchable library. The cartoon on the right shows you what artists imagined and what will happen to someone searching for the meaning of the universe in the library. She says, Borges' infinite and unsearchable library is reflected in the Maynard Smith collection of all possible protein sequences. But our problem really for the last two years has been with the sequence of this protein. 1,273 acids, 1,273 letters in its sequence. In our Smith's sequence space would be 20 raised to 1,273, which is 10 raised to 1,656 sequences, which is an impossible number to understand. White protein is a Trojan horse. It's recognized by the ACE2 receptor and then enters the cell where it disgorges the nucleic acid. Now, as a result, much of our efforts to combat the coronavirus have targeted the spike protein. And we must try and understand this. Many, many people in the world have worked on this, but I just want to tell you some things that we have learned by looking at the data set which, have, which is available in the NCBI database. This is not the kind of data set which is available. In, uh, Indian sequences are there only in limited amounts. So we've examined only United States sequences. United States sequences are interesting because they did allow the coronavirus to spread in all its forms. So over a period of time, you can ask, how did the mutations grow? 
And you can see that the number of mutations accumulated have grown. And these are now can be correlated with different stages of the pandemic. The two people who helped me to do this kind of analysis, Professor Joshi and Dr. Vijay Sarte, their pictures are shown here. If we go back to the coronavirus, and today is not a day for a technical talk, this is what we have in the United States and India in July 2021. We've had about 600,000 deaths in, in, in America and about 400,000 deaths in India at that time. We are also familiar now with three variants, two variants at that time, Alpha and Delta, which everybody talked about. The mutations are shown here. Ten mutations in Alpha, ten mutations in Delta. They accumulate others as time goes on. But what did these mutations do? They usually deleted bulky residues in the end terminus domain of the stroke. But in November 2021, and some of you might have been infected with this strain, which was a milder strain, a strain appeared with 30 plus mutations. And I show you those mutations. You're not going to be able to make any sense of these mutations, but it does not matter. Because what we can do is we can start from the earliest days in which sequences appeared in the database or collections were made of samples. This is available. And then you can plot these. So you can see specific mutations appear as a function of time. The D614G, which is a single point mutation, drove the coronavirus pandemic. It happened very early in the pandemic in March or April of 2020. After that, it went wonderfully fast. But you can see in America, the alpha strain has given way to the delta strain sometime in July of 2021. And you can see an almost perfect titration here as one goes down and the other goes up. How do you draw these graphs? You can simply take specific mutations and map them to do this. There are two mutations which I will draw your attention to at position 681. This is the so-called furin cleavage site which has been a very controversial sequence in the coronavirus because many people have argued that this site could have been acquired only by laboratory intervention. But here there is a replacement of proline to histidine in the case of the alpha variant and proline to arginine in the case of the delta variant. What happens is fusion rates increase and once this increase, transmissibility also increases. So one can follow infection dynamics by mapping mutations, and this is not very important for today's discussion. One might ask, what do these mutations do? The D614G clearly affects conformational dynamics and allows more facile binding of the protein to its receptor. But there's other kinds of data which is interesting, which one can map. You can see in America over a function of time, what I have along the x-axis is days, beginning with January 1 of 2020. So 300 means we are very close to the end of 2020. You can see that there is a red mutant which came from Brazil, which has also coexisted. So for a little while in America, many strains have co-circulated. And this would, of course, raise the problem of what will happen if there's co-infection and recombination. Today, if you look at the literature, you will find that all the mutations of the Omicron mutant have been mapped. They're at different points in the spike protein. And you might ask the question, what have they taught us? On the left side of the slide is something taken from, the, from Francis Collins' site when he was director of NIH, the director's blog. He schematically indicates the way antibodies might bind to the spike, wire, spike protein, the receptor binding domain, the N terminal domain, and the S2 subunit. This is something that should be of interest in the National Institute of Immunology. Let's go back to the Omicron mutant. I don't want to say much about it except to tell you how science has changed and why we should think about this on Science Day. Omicron mutant sequence was first reported on Twitter on November 23rd, 2021. It was corrected on November 25th, 2021, 
to change the mutation at residue 493, which I've colored in green, from lysine to arginine. Many mutations which were there in other viruses have also been found here. But there are some interesting differences. The difference that I want to show you is what marked in blue. There's an insertion here. So far, we've seen single point mutations and we've seen deletions. Now here for the first time, we are seeing an insertion of residues. EPE, glutamic acid, proline, glutamic acid, inserted into the end terminal domain. But that's not important. Look at the dates again, November 23rd, November 25th. Where does the EPE come in? Already on December 23rd, December 3rd, 2021, on the archives, there is a paper It says that this unique insert has come from coronavirus 229E, Dorothy Hamre's original human coronavirus, probably from co-infection and what these authors say is template switching during the synthesis of the RNA. Of course, there will be controversy. Another paper appearing in December of 2021, not even a few days after the report of the sequence, saying that the progenitor of Omicron jumped from humans to mice, rapidly accumulated mutations conducive to infecting the host, then jumped back into humans, indicating an interspecies evolutionary trajectory for the Omicron of Neither of these may be accepted finally in the literature, but this is the way science is moving and the pace at which it is moving is remarkable. And in this slide, I show you the remarkable pace with which Omicron has been attacked. November 25th, the corrected sequence. Here on the 27th of December, there is a paper which has already been sent to science reporting the structure of the Omicron version of the spike protein complex to the soluble domain of the receptor angiotensin converting enzyme. And this is just about a month. Accepted, it's online February 8th of 2022. So when we want to do science in India, we must keep in mind the pace at which things are being done and the pace and coordination with which we must move if we are to remain even remotely competitive. Since you are in the National Institute of Immunology and presumably have been involved with vaccine design, remember that vaccine design requires that you understand your chemistry. And I give you a reference here, which is provocatively entitled, Proteins Prefer Prolines. And it is the specific introduction of two proline residues at consecutive positions in the S2 domain of the spike protein, it stabilizes the pre-fusion conformation. So those who take the Moderna BioNTech or Pfizer vaccines, in fact, have this version of the spike protein. I'll go back in conclusion to something general. The world has changed over the last two years, and it's changing even more in the last one week after the Ukraine invasion started. We might go back and look at an article by Joshua Lederberg written in 1988 at the height of the HIV epidemic. He titled it Medical Science, Infectious Disease and the Unity of Humankind. And I will quote here. He says, Human intelligence, culture, and technology have left all other plant and animal species out of the competition. We also may legislate human behavior. Of course, I must note that we cannot legislate human behavior. But we have too many illusions that we can. By writ, govern the remaining vital kingdoms. The microbes that remain are competitors of last resort for dominion of the planet. The bacteria and viruses know nothing of national sovereignty. In that natural evolutionary competition, there is no guarantee that we will find ourselves the survivor. He goes on to add that, you know, we would have to share the planet with our internal and external parasites and have an equilibrium, the terms of which are sometimes unbelievable. 
But then he adds that propensity for technological sophistication, harness to intraspecies competition, adds a further dimension of hazard. It is important to note the phrase that he uses, intraspecies competition. He concludes, and this is my more or less the end of my presentation. I have only two more slides. But he says, as one species, we share a common vulnerability to these cultures. No matter how selfish our motives, we can no longer be indifferent to the suffering of others. The microbe that felled one child in a distant continent yesterday can reach yours today and see the global pandemic tomorrow. He goes to the Bible and he says, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for me. Lastly, we might ask, where did the coronavirus come from? Did it come by natural evolution or laboratory creation? We don't know. There's been a lot of argument in the literature and I've also been involved in summarizing some of these articles in our local journals. But when I was doing this, I was reminded of a poem which I'd read many years ago by William Blake called The Tiger. And what Blake had a poem also called The Lamb. And then he noted that both the lamb and the tiger were extraordinarily symmetric. They looked beautiful, beautiful of course, bilateral symmetry, which is so common in biology. And he wrote, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? You might take this further to wonder about the coronavirus, that wonderfully spherically symmetric object that you see on the extreme right of the slide, dotted rather nicely with the spike protein projections on its surface. We do not know where exactly it came from. Was it made in the laboratory? Was it natural evolution, zoonotic transfer from bats to another intermediary animal? But in the long months of the pandemic, very often we spent our time at our desks and our computers and looking at the literature. I wanted a quotation to end this. A friend of mine sent me this, he said, Quoted John Le Carre, the spy novelist, he said, survival is an infinite capacity for suspicion. I went back and found another Le Carre quotation. A desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world because you get suspicious of many things that you read. Other lessons from the pandemic. We've talked generally about chemistry, generally about biology in the era of the pandemic. Nature periodically provides a reminder of the limits of human arrogance. Two groups of people, those who practice politics and those who spread religion, both of them have proved remarkably helpless in the face of the pandemic. The pandemic has reminded us that the virus does not care what your affiliations really are. Also demonstrated, nature frequently demonstrates that the frontiers of science are truly endless. A phrase which I've borrowed from Vannevar Bush's famous report after the Second World War, which touched off the revolution in modern science with enhanced funding. It was entitled Science, an Endless Frontier. That's the kind of phrase we must think about on Science Day. And for those of you who are interested in biology, remember that biology assisted by the chemistry of molecular variation is a formidable force of nature. And formidable forces of nature are sometimes very difficult to come. That brings me then to the end of my rather digressive presentation on chemistry and biology in the age of the coronavirus. But I thought this would be fitting on Science Day. In my last slide, 
I have to acknowledge the two institutions which have provided me shelter for almost my entire professional life. The Indian Institute of Science at the top left, all the way from 1973 to 2014. And the National Center for Biological Sciences in the bottom right, which has provided me a home in my days of retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Balaram. Uh, it was an amazing presentation uh, covering many areas. And uh, with your permission, uh, can I ask for questions or comments from the audience? Yeah, certainly, if I can answer. Sure, absolutely. So if there are any questions or comments, uh, you might please raise your hand or preferably type it on the chat box. Yeah, one of the observation is that, I mean, of course, if anyone in the audience, be it a physicist or a chemist or a biologist or a literature person or a statistician or an administrator or the political scientist, I'm sure everyone had something to take home. And one of the comment I was going to ask you is about the antiviral drug development. Uh, any comments on that? I think those who uh, are very confident about quick antiviral drug development are incurable optimists. And uh, antiviral drugs have a history. One should go back and look at them and see the extent to which they are uh, have been successful. I think sometimes history is very important in science, detailed technical history. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. Because you need targets, targets are constantly mutating, and uh, you will apply selection pressures. You know, I would leave something for the audience to think about, which I've been thinking in recent days. We often do a selection pressure experiment by indiscriminate use of antibiotics to kill bacteria and select out uh, strains which are now resistant to antibiotics. Time, I suspect nature has done the experiment on us where it's unleashed a virus. Uh, many of us have got infected. Some of us have survived. Some of us have succumbed. Others have been largely unaffected. But there's no guarantee that uh, nature will not produce uh, another surprise. Sure. Um, Dr. Pushka Sharma, would you have any uh, comments? Uh, when, uh, you asked. Uh, the question I wanted to ask about antiviral, but let me get even more primitive. Any hope, I mean, I'm going back because I work on malaria on, on the success of artemisinin and the history of it. Any hope from medicinal plants and, and India specific medicinal plants uh, of, of hitting a cure? I mean, of course, you need a good fortune. Uh, Professor Balram. No, I think the idea of natural product screening, especially with uh, the anecdotal history of uh, Ayurveda and other traditional systems is critical because today, if you have a good biological screen, you should be able to screen large libraries of molecules. Unfortunately, a complete ignorance of chemistry does not help the screener, uh, which is what has happened in many of the programs that we've had in India for a very long time. There is a need yeah. to work together and to understand the complexities of both sides. Uh, it is not going to be, uh, you're not going to screen a natural product library and get a drug tomorrow, but you have to be patient and you have to be, uh, follow it with the methods of science that we have today. It should be, uh, I'm very optimistic that it should be possible. What we do not have is the scientific environment in which such a collective endeavor can be practiced. Uh, none of our institutions have a collective endeavor in almost any project that they want to do. And certainly no group of institutions can get together to have a collective endeavor. When you don't have such a collective endeavor, nature is a formidable enemy. 
nature is a far more formidable enemy than uh, anything that human beings can conjure. So, uh, I think we need to respect uh, science in this. Yep, I absolutely agree with you, sir. Any, any other question? Yeah, is Dr. Basak, Swamin Basak, please unmute. Go ahead. Yes, I'm on. Hello. <laughs> Hello, sir. It was wonderful to hear from you. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, you know, taking this opportunity to of this uh, rather broad, uh, you know, discussions that we are having here uh, and being an undergraduate in chemistry discipline. So, you know, I sort of think that it's true. Chemistry is more fundamental uh, as a science and then biology is this conception about life that dominates life science and biology. When, I mean, you know, if I can uh, sort of uh, ask a provocative question, uh, when uh, did they uh, get married? Is it through this RNA? Not, not at all. I think badly, uh, 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 you should read Kornberg because in the late 1980s, Kornberg wrote in the best of American journals, he wrote these essays in which he lamented. In fact, I didn't have that slide, but uh, if I can quote from memory, he says that uh, he lamented that molecular biology uh, sort of washed away the bridges uh, between biology and biochemistry. And the result of this was that biochemistry was largely neglected, which is detailed chemistry. All of what you know in a biochemistry textbook was done by biochemists who were actually all chemists or clinicians with a huge knowledge of chemistry. Entire metabolic chart is a result of this. It's phenomenal. You know, today when people who are religious talk about religious texts, remember that for a biologist, a metabolic chart should be a religious text. You can't talk of systems biology and nonsense like this without appreciating uh, the art that has gone into creating a metabolic chart. And if you look carefully, you'll find chemical structures all over. But what happened when DNA molecular biology, as I call it, I'm not a great fan of uh, the nucleic acids because sometimes I believe the focus on the nucleic acids with their limited chemistry has taken away the sort of respect that biologists had for detailed chemistry. And I don't think this has been true in America. In America, because of undergraduate education, it doesn't matter, you study, you can't get into medical school without getting an A grade in organic chemistry. The result of this is American clinicians are well grounded in their chemistry. India, on the other hand, has been exactly the opposite. Today, all the people who came out of our biotechnology courses of the 1980s are probably nearing retirement. And uh, sad to say that the chemistry grounding in those biotechnology courses was lamentable. We knew it. We refuse to address this, and this is largely because of uh, an inadequate appreciation of what you need to do in it. Today, I feel sad uh, when I see uh, people talking about genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, all the omics, which only is the numbers of molecules. You don't know one molecule, you can't do a thousand. You can't do it sensibly. Software is not the solution. However much one may talk about artificial intelligence, it's not here to replace human intelligence. It's only there to complement. Varun, can I come in? Yeah, please, please do. Yes, of course. Sir, uh, that just encourages me to ask you Next question. Swamin, did I, do you want it to continue? I'm sorry if I jumped in. Uh, uh, we can, so, we can uh, come back to Swamin. It just encourages me to, uh, so, yeah, talk, it, it just encourages me to ask this question. 
Someone can think about my rejoinder and come back with the supplement. <laughs> so the thing is that we are all thinking, but the problem is, and uh, we absolutely agree with what you say. And, and Gopalan being our uh, in-house chemist and so on, we have had this discussion. And when I tell him chemistry is more important than biology, he thinks I'm being sarcastic. But I mean, I, 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 actually, I just, I mean, I, I, I don't do it to make him feel important, but that is the point. I mean, it's as important as biology. The problem is that, I mean, we do not have the expertise now to train people uh, uh, in chemistry. I mean, we can do all kinds of omics, but can we teach mass spectrometry to the level? I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, make it a mutual admiration society that you can teach. And I've heard your seminars on that. The point, uh, and that's just one example. I mean, here is a golden opportunity with all kinds of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, resolution possible on a mass spectrometer, all kinds of scientific problems you're itching to address, and you probably think you have addressed some of them, but I think there's a huge hole, and which you alluded to in your slide, and also your description of American clinicians and understanding of chemistry. I mean, in this country, I mean, how do we fill those large gaps? First, we have to recognize. <laughs> Uh, we have to recognize that we cannot use technologies. You might ask the question, how were these technologies developed and why were they developed in America? Or why was electrospray ionization developed by John Fell when he wanted to measure the masses of large molecules? And so there is a logical progression in the development of technologies. Since we are not doing that, finally, when a technology becomes widely applicable, we would like to use the technology. But we then lack the fundamental grounding. And in some way, I must fault all senior people for uh, not actually emphasizing the importance of fundamental grounding in the subject. In today, the teaching of physics, it, there is still fundamental grounding. You can't do physics even if, if you don't learn Maxwell's equations of the 19th century and you don't learn quantum mechanics of the early 20th century. These are fundamental to the subject. Ask yourself, what is fundamental in biology? And then define it, yeah. and then you have to teach it. So I think the inability of, uh, in India, of the biological community, which is again a diverse community, field biologists and uh, uh, Laboratory biologists have very little in common. But if, for example, chemical ecology is to develop as a discipline, you must have natural products chemists and field biologists working yeah. together. Uh, cannot be otherwise. Uh, drug discovery requires this. The drug discovery or natural product screening or bioprospecting and chemical ecology are two sides of the same coin. One asked, why is the plant making all these things? The other asked, can we make any use of it? That's all. Uh, so, go ahead. Pushkar, do you have any further? No, no. No, no, sure. no, I was so, just running out your fine. name. Are there, fine, sure. Are there, uh, it's good. It's been little more than an hour. Uh, are there any further comments? And uh, it, it, if it, not, it doesn't uh, matter that there's a comment. Uh, yeah, there is a, one in the chat box uh, that I will read uh, from Syed Yusuf Mayon to everyone. Sir, could you further comment on the laboratory evolution of the virus? As I can tell you what I know, uh, there's a lot of conflicting literature on this. Very early in the pandemic, when the sequence was reported in nature, uh, attention was immediately drawn to the furin cleavage site, which is a small site where there is a succession of basic residues, which allows the protein to be cleaved at that point. Arginine is present there. And this was not present in any of the other coronavirus sequences known at that time. And it appeared to have been actually inserted there. Because we don't know how could this insertion come. This question you might ask, because right now I gave you an example of how the EPE insertion came into the Omicron. Similar explanation could not be given at that time at all and still has not been given. Therefore, 
uh, people who were suspicious. In fact, there was a group at IIT Delhi, which very early on uh, put up a, a post on the bio archive, which was then taken down, but they controversial. And many others who said that this is laboratory derived, largely because Virology laboratories, most notably those working on the SARS coronavirus, have had the ability to make synthetic viruses for some time. So, a laboratory at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill collaborated with the Wuhan laboratory and published papers in Nature Medicine in 2015, where you know all these techniques were in fact talked about. So it looked perfectly reasonable that a new viral sequence might have been investigated in the laboratory and then accidentally leaked out from the laboratory. That was the uh, uh, what many other people called the conspiracy theory of the origin of the coronavirus. Today, it's no longer a conspiracy theory. Uh, it is a theory which uh, is as credible as the natural evolutionary theory with uh, many jumps between uh, animal species, which whom we have not identified. You know, unless you do a forensic investigation, you can't ever come to a conclusion. Thank you very much. Yeah. So with this, well, probably I think we should come to the conclusion. And uh, I would also, I don't know. I was just just occurred to me whether by design or otherwise, uh, Professor Balram's lab used to be very proximal to our lab far removed from molecular biology unit main building. And I hope with the stress on fundamental, there is no better day to remind ourselves on fundamentals. And hopefully we have not reached a point of no return uh, so that we could set things right and understand technology development rather than just being consumers. And there is no better advocate than Professor Balaram to do this. It has been an absolute pleasure listening to you. And uh, thanks for all the audience for attending online. And I will give the final word to our director, Dr. Pushka Sharma. Please. Well said, well said, Gopalan. Uh, sir, it was just brilliant how you wove magic and, it, and we created this fabric of chemistry, biology, virology, and so on and so forth. And emphasizing of each, each thread in that fabric was just, I will just say it was just beautiful. And thanks so much for accepting our invitation, sir. And uh, and hope we will meet uh, 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 physically one day, and we, every time we do, we always uh, 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 benefit something out of you. Thanks very much, and 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 thank you well, and stay safe. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot.